so we're now going to look at the electric field of a uniform ring of charge, as shown in this picture here. Uh, this picture is taken from uh, a different textbook, but it's certainly going to work for what we want to do today. So we're going to have a ring like this. Well, that popped right in there okay, I guess. kind of want to make it bigger, though. Maybe like this. So we have a ring that we're looking at kind of uh, on edge. And our goal is to find for our ring what the value of the electric fields would be at some point that we'll call P along an x-axis. And we'll draw our x-axis in here like this. And we're going to define uh, we're going to define this distance here to be x, and that's the positive x direction going off that direction. The ring that we have here is filled with charges. So I'm just going to say there's positive charges that are kind of distributed all along this ring here. In the classroom at El Camino, we have a hula hoop that someone uses to, or I used also to demonstrate this one. And the hoop has just got little positive charges written all over it. So we've got a ring. The ring is kind of oriented coming out of the page, as you can see with the, the, the pictures up here. I'm drawing my own picture just because I think it helps to see how the, the picture uh, grows over time. Professor, when you say that find the electric field, do you mean the strength? The strength of the electric field? Yeah. Like the magnitude of the electric Yeah, that's right. And we're only looking at just this one point. Um, and we're also making the assumption here that if I was to take another line, and if I draw a line from here up to here, oh, no, no, no. Hold down Alt, right? So I hold down Alt and then I draw it. Nope. Okay. Click black, click shapes, click this. If I draw a line straight up here to like, let's say the top, or really any point on this object, that line is going to make a right angle. It's going to have a length A. That's going to be the radius of our ring. Um, and, and then our, we're going to get a right angle at this location here. Um, so that gives you an idea of how this thing is positioned. It's at, it's at right angles to our x-axis that we've drawn. We're saying the total charge on this object is capital Q. And we want to find the electric field at that point there. We'll go about doing so in the exact same way we did in the previous problem. We're going to break up our object into little pieces. The pieces that we cut it into, we're going to call, as you can see on the picture here, dq. We'll draw a line from that point out to the point P, just like we did in the last problem. So starting from here, we'll draw a line from here to here. That's going to be our R in this case, as you can see in the picture above. We'll define again the angle that's made with the x-axis here to be theta. And again, I'll ask you, if this dq is a positive charge, and I want to draw the direction of the electric field vector at point P, what direction will it point? points away. If it was a negative charge, it would go that way, right? But it's a positive charge, so it goes this way. It looks kind of pretty much right. So there's our electric field vector. Again, we define this electric field vector to be a vector and say that it's DE. Put a little vector symbol right here. We notice that the angle theta here is going to be the same as the angle theta here and that we can drop and make components of this again. You can see the components that have been drawn right here. Um, I'm going to draw the x component in here. So our x component is going to point somewhere like this. OK, if I want to do this properly, it's going to have to go like kind of like there. So that's going to be dex, the x component of de points along the x-axis. And then the other vector is going to point at a right angle to that, kind of down like this. I hope I did that right. This should be parallel to this, right? I think it looks kind of parallel. Um, so then there's going to be a right angle right there. And then the, the language they're using here is DE perpendicular. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'll do the same. Why do they do that? We can't really call it the y direction. I mean, maybe this, is, maybe this is the y direction or something like this, but then the z direction would kind of come out of the board this way, right? So, you know, if, if 
I called this, maybe this points exactly along the y direction, I don't know, but if we were to pick, for example, a DQ that was like over here, and imagine drawing the line to here, this is where you have to use your imagination. You draw a line from this point to this point, it's gonna have an electric field vector that kind of goes back that way. Okay, it gets really confusing, and I don't know. But if we just if we just imagine that for every piece of this object that we choose, they're all gonna have a DEX pointing in this direction, and they're gonna have DEs that point like this. Um, but just like in the last problem, this component is gonna cancel. Because for example, I could pick a point on the exact opposite side, right? Do the exact same thing that we've done and it would produce a de perpendicular component that points in the opposite direction right that would be something like you know you, you draw a line from here to here and you go up to there you get a dex component but your these two are basically going to cancel each other out and i can play that game all around the object would you guys agree with that statement that's what they're showing in this picture up here so again, all we need to worry about now is just the x component due to the symmetry within the problem. All right. So this is what we're going to be finding, just the ex. Once again, we can say that that's going to be related to this vector de by taking a, putting a cosine theta in here. That'll be the shadow projection, as you guys were calling it, of de onto the x-axis. We again say DE is equal to some K times DQ divided by R squared. We can also put into here something about cosine theta, but we'll leave that off for now. Now, in this problem, um, we're going to be done very quickly. After the next line, we're pretty much going to be done. So do you guys have any questions? Is it better to integrate in terms of theta? Well, let's let's look at some things here real quickly. How do I want to write dq, right? So our method of, of dealing with our dqs is to say, well, dq is a portion of this entire object, right? And I highly recommend that you just kind of go through this process every time, even if you feel like you need to skip a step, it's fine. DQ in this case is going to be lambda times, I don't know, something. Well, if it's a circle, it's going to be something like lambda, I would call it DS, where we're basically saying any piece of this object has an arc length that we call DS. And then we say, well, what's lambda equal to? What would lambda be equal to? R times theta mm, no you're thinking of D, ds might be related to theta like that what's just lambda equal to just lambda by itself what's the total so you basically just take total charge yep it would be q divided by l and by l you mean okay type we put it correctly it would be q over 2 pi a right i take q and I divide by the length of the circle, which is the circumference, so Q over 2 pi A, right? Okay, so we've got this in our back pocket. We can use that, Q over 2 pi A. We know lambda and DQ related like this, right? All right, so let's uh, let's kind of plug these in to our equation here. Let's see, let's see where we go with that. I'm actually adding a step here that I, that I didn't really need to add, but that's okay. That's totally okay. So dq has become lambda ds, but lambda is q over 2 pi a. So let's put it all in at once. So q divided by 2 pi a. All I'm replacing now is this term here. And the lambda needs to go in there too, right? No, that is the lambda. We just need to multiply by ds. All right. So let's start thinking about some things here. Is the value of r going to change as we go around our ring? Nope. Is the value of a obviously not? Pi 2, no. What about the value of theta? Does that change? Nope. If r doesn't change and a doesn't change and x doesn't change, this triangle is the same for every piece that we choose. 
Well, that's interesting. Everything is constant, right? So now if I do my integral on both sides, right? The left-hand side will just give me e sub x, the x component. The right-hand side, I've got k, I've got r squared, I've got 2 pi a, uh, I've got the q, I've got the cosine theta term, and what I'm left with is just integral ds. And that's going to give me basically just the arc length, right? It's going to be the total length or circumference of the circle. So what I end up getting is k q over 2 pi a. Now we're going to start replacing everything. So the ds part right here, that part right there is just going to be 2 pi a by itself. Okay, I'll put that at the end. What about cosine theta? What if I wanted to write theta in terms of a and x, or cosine theta in terms of a and x? I think I would argue something like this, but kind of similar to what we did in the last problem. We could say cosine theta is equal to x, right, divided by r, but r is just a squared plus x squared square root, right? So that's what cosine theta is. And what about r? Well, r is just so. If I plug those all in together, what we're going to get is for cos theta, we write x divided by square root of a squared plus x squared. And then for r squared, what I'm going to have is one divided by a squared plus x squared. Putting it all together, what we notice is that this piece cancels out with that piece. And we get, if I didn't make any mistakes, we've got k, we've got q, we've got an x. And then the denominator what we have is the square root of this thing. multiplied by the same thing squared, so you're going to end up with 3 halves power right here. And I think that's the answer. Definitely has the right units, because the denominator has units of length cubed, and this has units of length, so you get length squared in the denominator, which is what you want. I think that's the right answer. What do you guys think? Did I make any mistakes? Does it make sense? Questions? That was pretty easy. You'll notice a lot of the steps are the same. Like you have to write this VQ thing. You got to define what lambda is. For all the variables, the variables that you have, you have to kind of rewrite the variables in terms of something else. And then used fixed quantities. And there you go. We're gonna use this result for the next problem. So. Let's ask some uh, basic questions about this. What do you get if x equals to 0? What does ex become? What does the electric field become? This is the total field, by the way, because we said these all canceled. What does ex become if I it's 0? Does that make sense? It's saying that if you're at the center of the ring and you're surrounded by all these positive charges right here, the field is 0. Does that seem reasonable to you guys? Can you explain why? It seems reasonable, right? You got one positive charge over here, another positive charge over here, they kind of cancel out. One here and one here, they all cancel out, yeah. Now, if half of this thing was positive and half of this thing was negative, there'd be a different answer to that, though. You, you would get some electric field inside of this. That's, that's a different story. Yeah, because it each better than just an opposite vector. That's right, Nathan. Okay, what about uh, as x goes to infinity, what does ex become? I don't know if x going to infinity would be the right thing to do. It definitely can't go to infinity. That doesn't sound right to me because you've got 
x to the third power in the denominator and x in the numerator, so it's definitely not going to go to go to infinity. I think it's going to go to zero. Yeah. Right? Because you've got x to the first power in the denominator, you've got x cubed in the denominator, so this is going to win, right? x cubed will win. So what about what about something kind of in between? What about just x being much, much greater than a? I actually don't even think this is right. I actually think this isn't exactly right. I think that it actually is going to be the same as the answer we get for this now that I look at it. I think what you're going to get is kq over x squared. Because if you take x going to infinity, this term is going to be significantly larger than this term. So you end up getting x over x cubed, and that reduces down to just this. Yeah, kq x over x cubed, which you could reduce down to this number right here. So it actually doesn't go to zero. Now, at infinity, certainly this term goes to zero, but at least you can have an expression for the, the way that this behaves as you go to infinity. The same thing can be said if you say x much, much greater than a. This is a much better way of saying what I'm trying to say here, which is now ex goes to the same thing, basically, which is, again... What is this the representation of? It's the electric field of what? A point charge. That's right. Got a question here that I never answered. Okay. Yeah, I, you could say at infinity the value of this approaches zero, you would say, I guess, maybe, or something like that? Yeah. If x, like, at infinity, for sure, this, this quantity becomes zero. That's that's true. Approaches zero, for sure. All right. Um, that's it for that. Okay, now, remember, this is our result for the electric field due to a ring of charge. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this result here. I'll just copy it. Let's put it down here. Oops. Put it down here. And we're going to use that for the next problem, which is this guy right here. For a disk. You guys have something similar to this in your homework on the lab manual, where you have to do something similar. So remember that this is what we're doing. This is for the ring of charge. Of radius A, right? on axis. We're going to use this to solve this problem. So now we want to find the electric field of a uniformly charged disk. It's a disk that has a radius r and a uniform surface charge density sigma. Okay. So sigma is the charge density. Let's go ahead and start working on what that means as we can. Sigma represents the charge divided by the area of the object. Okay, so if I tell you that the total charge of the object is Q, what will the area of such an object be? The outer radius of this thing is capital R. What would you write down for sigma? Q divided by what area down here? I know there's going to be a pi in it. Yeah, and there's going to be a capital R, and it's going to be squared. So we've already got our sigma. That's helpful. We know that that's useful to us. Let's just box that in. We'll use that later. Um, calculate the electric field at point P that lies along the central perpendicular axis of the disk at a distance X from the center of the disk. Right here. That's what we want to find. I don't know how well you guys can see these things. Let me, um, let me blow this one up just a little bit. Mm, okay, let's just make this one smaller. No, that's not helpful. Let's move it down here. Just do like that this up to here okay just so you guys can see these symbols so we're at point p it's along the x-axis um and now you'll see that uh this disc what's being done in this picture right here is it's saying instead of considering a single piece of the disc to be dq because it turns out that that conflict that that calculation ends up being really challenging what if instead we take this solid disc right and we cut it into rings Okay, so each ring is going to have this same, it's going to be a ring, right, that we cut out of it. Yeah, something like the shell method that you guys use, something like that. 
No? I mean, it's similar to it. It's not the same thing. But... We're cutting it into pieces, right? Um, so we cut out a ring, and we say that the ring that we cut out has a radius little r. It has a thickness dr, okay? And it has a total charge that's called dq. Now, this dq is going to be on the entire ring that we've cut out of this object. And it's a distance x away, right? So what I would say is that this is going to produce an x component of the electric field at this location that we can call dex and that the value of it is going to be related to this right here. But it's just certain things are going to change. So in this problem, what I would say is we have this DEX is going to be equal to, we're going to look at this right here, and we're just going to change some things. So look at our picture right here. Um, does X change? No, X is still the distance from here to here, right? So we know we're going to have that X in there. I'll, I'll leave that right here. We'll put something in right here for Q. Q is going to change. What about these things here? Do, do either of these change? What was a squared in the previous problem? What was the washer method? That sounds about right. What was a squared in the previous problem? What did a represent? It's actually written on the page here. Nope. X is the distance. It's the radius. So in this problem, a basically goes to R, right? Okay, so now our equation on the bottom is going to be R squared plus X squared. Notice it's a little r, not a big R. Big R is the is the, is the the edge. And still to the 3 half power, X didn't change. What does Q become now? What does Q become? It's DQ, that's right. And now we just start from here and do the same things we did in previous steps. Anyone have any questions? Basically, this equation here has now become this one here. We let A go to R, and we let big Q, which was the total charge on the ring before, go to DQ. Because D2 is now the charge on the entire darker ring that we've cut out here. Okay? All right. So, what do we do next? What's the next step going to be? Something like that. I don't know if that's exactly right there. I think it looks right, but we'll see. We need to figure out what dq is, right? And let's just start from what we said at the beginning of class. If I have something that has the charge spread out over the area, we can say that dq is equal to sigma. What did I say it was multiplied by? Sigma times what? da. Oh, you already wrote it. My, I didn't see what you said there. So it's sigma da. That's right. Sigma da. What's da going to be? How do I figure out what da is? What does da represent? It represents an infinitesimal amount of area that corresponds to the place where dq is. So I would argue that that area is this area inside of this ring right here, basically. That is all of that that's inside of there is what we would call dA. I don't know if it helps to do that, but basically inside of that whole thing there is what we call dA. Now, how do we figure out what value we choose for this? What is dA going to be equal to? What is dA equal to? Why did I change? We're doing that thing again where I can't pick colors? Okay. What is, uh, what's DA equal to? How, how would you figure out what that is? Someone said 2 pi r dr. Someone said dx dy. Someone said pi r squared dr. Which one of them is right? How do we know? If we were using an xy coordinate system, we could definitely say it's just dx dy. There's definitely going to be situations in which we can do that. We're not really using an xy coordinate system, though, so that's not going to help us in this case. It, you see the x here, and so I can see why you'd want to do that, but there's no y's. So pi times r minus r 
squared. So you're thinking about kind of like the area of a ring, right, Bella? That's certainly a good way to think about that. Except in this case, it would be something like, I don't know, it'd be like pi times like r squared minus r plus dr squared, right? That is that what you're thinking, Bella? Something like that? And you're on the right track. That What you wrote down is, in fact, the, like, area of a donut, right? Or as of a, of a ring or something like that, right? But, but this would be kind of closer because the inner radius is r, right? And the outer radius would be r plus dr. Now, we can actually use this to find the answer if you guys want to. So let's do it. Let's just let's use this to find the answer. So this would tell us the da would be, and I'm just going to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and do some things here to make more room. I don't want to squeeze too much stuff in here. It'd be kind of a waste. Let's just shift this off the page. We don't need that anymore. We already used it. Just delete that. And then we can kind of make these bigger. So what we what we need to do now is just say, okay, well we've got pi this thing doesn't change minus we need to square this out so it's going to become r squared plus dr squared plus 2r dr and then we can start making some cancellations because um, You know what I did wrong? I did something wrong here, didn't I? Do you guys see what I did wrong at the beginning with this with this line? What did I do wrong, Ash? I reversed the order, yeah. All right, let's fix it. So it should have been, here, we'll just we'll erase this one. We'll do it right. It should have been um, this one minus r squared. All right, let's try that one more time. So we would get pi times r squared plus dr plus 2r dr minus r squared. And now we can see that this one cancels with this one. And I'm going to argue that however big r times dr is, I would argue that uh, dr squared is going to be at least an order of magnitude smaller to the point where we can neglect this term right here. We can say that it's going to be effectively equal to 0 relative to this term right here, okay? So what we get as an answer then is just da, and I think this was something that someone wrote, I'll look up there, I think uh, Taib we put this down right at the beginning. We're left with two times pi times r times dr. That's our da. It's the circumference multiplied by the thickness, right? Yep. And that's that's the other way you can think about it is if I want to find the size of this object right here, we can think about what I would say you cut it right here and you roll it out like a strip. Like imagine it was like a something you could turn into like a And then what we'd find is that one side would be 2 pi r, one side would be dr, the area of which would be da. This, this would be da now. All right, so it's however you really want to do it. And you're going to have problems like this throughout the semester. Um, and if you see another one where it's a ring, like you guys have a homework problem like this that's in the lab manual, you can pretty safely say this. But be careful. Be sure to use your brain every time because there'll be problems where you're doing some volume. be a little bit different. But you'll have problems where you're doing an area and it might not be the same. So just be careful. But this is how you do one of these. Okay, however you want to think about it. Multiple ways to solve it. Okay, so now we come back to where we were, just to remind us. Uh, we were trying to find what happens when we integrate this thing. And we realized we needed to figure out what dq was. And that led to us figuring out this. And then we're like, oh, we have to figure out what da is now. Right? So there's all these steps that happen before we jump blindly into solving the integral. I want to emphasize that. That you you want to be you want to make sure before you solve the integral you're not wasting your time. Why did dr squared turn to zero? I can give you multiple reasons why. 
One is because it's it's going to be very small relative to this term right here. Okay, I can give you another reason, and maybe you either are going to like this or you're going to hate it. But consider the term dr squared plus 2r dr. And let's remember that these drs, while you understand them in calculus, they have a meaning in, uh, in, in kind of the sciences as well. In the sciences, often what these drs represent is like a tiny, tiny number, right? They represent a tiny, tiny number, right? So let's, let's put this into terms that are easier to understand than looking at these differential things. So let's say that let's let's say we let r be equal to an actual distance, okay? So let's say we choose a distance that's 10 meters, something that's easy to think about, easy to do numbers with, okay? And then let's say that dr, well it has to represent as Ash just said an infinitesimally small value, so maybe dr represents something like, I don't know, 10 to the negative 9 meters, like a nanometer, okay? And this is extreme. This will this will prove the point beyond a shadow of a doubt. I could change this to a centimeter and it would still prove it, but uh, so let, let's say we plug these numbers into our equation here and let's see what we have, okay? dr squared is going to become 10 to the negative 18. And then of course meters squared. Plus 2 times r, well r is 10 meters, and then dr is 10 to the negative 9 meters. So what we have is 10 to the negative 18 meters squared plus 20 times 10 to the negative 19. Just ne negative 9, sorry. 10 to the negative 9 meters. Okay. Now, if you were to plug this into your calculator, and I encourage you to do so, what do you get as an answer? I'm just curious. Plug that into your calculator and tell me what you get, if I can find my calculator here. I can do so on. I'll do it on the screen, I guess. You're going to get, yeah, you're just going to get this, basically. Right? It does this. This changes... What does it change? It changes after this decimal point right here. This changes the ninth digit after the decimal point. So it won't even show up on your calculator, right? Does that answer your question? Joanier? Joanier? I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm awful. Yeah, okay, good. However you want to think about it. The other way to think about it is this number is infinitesimally small and it's squared. This number by itself is infinitesimally small, so certainly if you take something that's infinitesimally small and you square it, you're basically going to get zero, is the answer. Okay, that's a good question there. All right, let's go back to solving our problem. Our whole point was to figure out what dA is. If it's all, I, I'll leave this here. Whatever, I'll leave it there, it's fine. We can do most of this problem, I think, with what we have left. Okay, let us uh, go back to our, our solution here. So what we've got is our dEx... I have changed the thickness. I don't want to do that. So our dEx is going to be equal to k times dq, but dq is sigma times dA, and dA is this. So putting it all together at the same time. Don't want to leave that x out. And I think now we can actually solve this integral. So let's put these limits on here. What are our limits of integration going to be if we're evaluating this integral over the r, or with respect to r? What should uh, the values of... Now, this is where you have to think about what size of rings are we going to choose, right? This is an intermediary value. What's the smallest ring we could make? r equal to what? Zero. And what's the biggest value of a ring we could make? Big R. Cool. Okay. So let's uh, let's just do the integral now. Now I'm, I'm going to move down because we're, we're done with the, the picture now in a way. So we get EX is equal to. We can pull K sigma 2 pi. I think that's it out of the integral. Do you guys want to do this integral yourselves? Oh, there's an x. We can pull x's out of the integral too, right? 
x is a x is a constant in this problem do you guys want to take a moment to try to do the integral yourself this is this one isn't too hard oh not three over x what am i doing that would be really hard it'd be extremely hard i assume it would i don't know it's a two you guys want to give it a shot give you a few minutes see if you can get an answer Take like two or three minutes. What do you guys think? Anyone got an answer? Hello? Why don't you just type out what the inside of the integral becomes? It's gonna, yeah, it's something like r squared plus x squared to what power? What'd you get? No, I understand that, but event. Yeah, but then you gotta do the integral. You end up getting something like what, like. Yeah, that's all I wanted, that part. This thing basically just becomes r squared plus x squared to the negative one half, right? And you've got some other junk. That, that's basically the, the features of it, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you end up doing, here, let's go through how you might do this. There's multiple ways to do it, right? You did something like u sub, right? So you said, uh, you said u equal to uh, the thing in the bottom. You said du was equal to uh, two r dr, right? Plugging those in here. There's actually a two here that we can pull into the integral to kind of deal with that. Because then RDR is in the numerator, so you end up getting integral of uh, basically, as you said, u to the negative three halves du. And we can change limits here if you want to or not, however you prefer to do it. Um, k sigma pi x. If we change the limits here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say when uh, r is equal to zero, Sorry, wait, yeah, it's r, right? Yeah, when r is equal to zero, then u is equal to uh, x squared, right? So x squared becomes the lower limit. And then if you put r equal to r, obviously you're gonna get big R squared plus x squared. We do the integral. As you said, you end up getting, uh, from this integral right here, you get u to the negative one half. But we have to divide by this, right? So you end up having a negative two in front 
that's one of the things you said you had, right? Negative 2k sigma pi x, looking like what you wrote. Yep. And then we just need to evaluate that between x squared. This one obviously gets a little messier than the ones we did a second ago. But we get that, and then that becomes what? Um, negative 2k sigma pi x. And we plug this in here and this one. So you get 1 over the square root. Now it's just u equal to x squared, so it's just x, right? And of course, we can move the negative sign inside of here, making this one negative, this one positive, this one positive. And of course, we can just get rid of the positive sign if we do that. And I think that's the right answer. Does it look right to you guys? We can, of course, replace this sigma. We're going to leave it here for now, though. We, we said what sigma was, it was q over pi r squared. But we're going to leave it in there because we want it in there for our final answer that we're going to look at here in a second. I'm just going to check. I don't want to give you guys the wrong information because you're probably going to end up using this if it looks right to me. Yeah, it looks right. They write it in a different form in your textbook. but Okay. You guys have any questions? Make sense. Alrighty. Now again, we want to kind of look at this is again this is the x component of the electric fields. I believe you guys are going to do a similar problem to this, except in your problem, this piece sigma is going to be something like b times r squared. All right, so you're not going to be able to just pull the sigma out of the equation. That's literally the only difference. You can you can almost exactly follow the steps that we did here up to the point when you do the integral, because then this is going to be a function of r, r squared or r cubed. I don't know what it is, r to the fourth, something like that. It's literally the only difference. But you can you can follow the steps exactly that we did. OK, what is the limit we want to look at for this one? You want to guess what the limit we're going to look at for this problem will be? Infinite radius, yeah, exactly which in our terms is going to be x very, very, very close to the, the object, right? So let's look at if it's a different color. So if um, x is much, much smaller than r, which is the same thing as r being much, much greater than x, if you'd like to think about it like that, what happens to our ex now? And maybe we need a couple lines to do this. So if x is much, much smaller than r, what happens? Can you visualize what's going to happen to this term? negative one over r, right? So we'll see if we can make it work out like this. So I think I think you can choose a lot of different ways to do this and it'll still work out. So let's just do this one at a time. So we say that this one now is going to become negative one over r plus one over x. All right. What is what's that going to become if x is a lot smaller than r or if r is much bigger than x? Negative 1 over r plus 1. You sure? Which one of these two terms is going to be bigger? Which one of these two terms is going to be bigger? It's an inverse, right? Which one will be bigger? It's backwards than what you would think, right? Because it's an inverse. So if r is significantly larger than x, then this term is the one that's going to go to 0. Because then r, think, imagine this. Imagine r is like a billion and x is like 1 right? It's basically 0 plus 1, right? So that means that ex now basically goes to, if we're, all we have left is 1 over x here, we actually end up getting 2 pi k sigma. There's no variables left. Look at that. There's no variables left. None at all. 
It's just constants, right? Just constants. Another way this is often written, this is equivalent, just to remind you, we haven't used it today, but I'm sure you should, saw it show up on your homework. K is also written as four, one over four pi epsilon naught. So that means that if I have two pi times K, that's equal to, you can multiply two in the pi up here, you're left with just one over two epsilon naught. So you get this really nice relationship, which is that EX ends up being equal to sigma divided by two epsilon naught. That is a result we will use a lot in this class. This is for a infinite sheet. This is one of the one of the relationships we're going to use in this class quite a bit. Something you need to commit to memory, or you don't need to commit to memory, but just something you're going to need to understand, I guess. This tells us that when I'm looking at an infinite sheet, okay. What's an infinite sheet? That would be like, imagine we've got this sheet, right? And it contains just charges and charges and charges and charges and charges. But let's say it just extends forever and forever and forever. What this tells us is that if you're anywhere near this sheet, that there's an electric field vector that points away from the sheet like this, and like this, and like this. Just straight lines. It becomes this nice, consistent, you know, pattern of electric field lines coming out from it. A sheet literally produces these beautifully straight lines like this. And it kind of has to if you think about it, because if it goes on forever, you're never going to have X and Y. You're never going to have Y components. You're only going to have X components, right? And something I left out of this is that the same thing would be happening on the opposite side. You'd have electric field vectors that would point this way. Kind of makes the kind of makes the picture work worse, but you can imagine that these field lines, they point all out away from this, almost like rain coming out of a shower head or something, or not rain, but water coming out of a shower head. And we can visualize this one here too. This was the infinite line of charge. There's a huge amount of symmetry. And if I put the infinite plane, so we've got conducting plate. I think we can get infinite plane. There we go. There we go. Infinite plane. It's nice and simple compared to what we were looking at before, right? It's just these nice, straight, parallel lines. And that is that is what the electric field looks like for this object, or at least the electric field lines. It's nice, straight lines that point like that. I could turn it sideways. Maybe I can turn it sideways. I don't know. But uh, there's your electric field. And we can change it to the field vectors if you want. That's the, this is a negatively charged plate here. So the field vectors go towards it. Um, we can make it a positively charged plate by doing that. But yeah, that's a, it's a nice, simple electric field in a way. And not only is it simple, but I don't know if you can tell this, the field vectors are the same length everywhere. They don't get smaller because it's infinitely big. If it's infinitely big, it doesn't matter where you are. It looks infinitely big. You know, it doesn't matter if you're way out here or if you're right up next to it. If it's infinitely big, it's infinitely big. And these lines just go straight away from it. Now, we can't really construct infinitely large objects, right? But we can make electric fields that look just like this. And we do so by using plates. So imagine we take a plate just like this and I, and I line up like this right here, okay? Wait, what, your, your question is, huh, Miaris? Can you be more specific? What's your question? Did I, did I lose you somehow? Oh, oh, it's, it's surprising, you're saying. It's surprising that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, So imagine that I take a positively charged plate right here. And next to it, I place a negatively charged plate. Turns out that these two objects will both have electric field lines and they, they become very straight right in between them. There's some curving out here and some curving here, but as long as you're right in between them, the electric field lines are nice and straight. And this type of object where you choose a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate will be one of the key things that we're talking about in this class. This type of device is called a capacitor and there's a whole chapter on it. Yeah, it's kind of like the lightning storms. That's right. It's like the lightning storm clouds. That's right. It's a capacitor. Yeah, we call that a capacitor. 
storage charges. Doesn't doesn't transfer charges, storage charges. Nope. It's not like a conductor. It's storage charges. Just stores them. They stay on the plates. A conductor allows them. Oh, these are electric field lines. They're field lines. So if you were to place a charged particle inside of here, like let's say you put an electron inside of here, it's going to feel a force back this way. And if you were to place a proton inside of here, it would feel a force this way. That's force though. And the way that we set the way we kind of separate these things, yeah, it just sits on the capacitor exactly. And it turns out these kind of things are extremely easy to make. Actually, all you have to do is you just take a wire on this guy, you take a wire on this guy, and you literally just connect them up to a battery. That's all you got to do. So we just we get a battery, we put the negative side of the battery over here, we put the positive side of the battery over here. Commonly, when we set things up, we use red leads for positive and black leads for negative. And then you just connect them to a piece of metal. You separate the metals by some gap of air. And positive charges flow up to this guy from the battery. Negative charges flow up to this guy from the battery. And te technically, what happens is only the negative charges flow. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but, you know. And it turns out that the electric field between the plates, I wonder if you guys can figure this out. If a single sheet of positive charge, that's what we have here on edge. This is a sheet of charge here, not a line, but a sheet. Right? Technically, there's there's dimensions to this thing. Um, if I put a single sheet of charge, right, and I tell you that that one, that one sheet by itself produces an electric field that's equal to this right here, right? And I put a negatively charged sheet and say, well, it's a negatively charged sheet, but it's going to do the same thing. It's going to produce an electric field that's also sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Can anyone tell me what's the electric field inside here equal to? The positive sheet produces this. The negative sheet also produces the same. What's the total? Double. Not zero, but double. Because remember, the electric field lines point away from positive, but they point towards negative. And if this one is sigma over 2 epsilon naught, and this one's also sigma over 2 epsilon naught, the field inside is just sigma over epsilon naught. Like that. Oh, man, I really wanted to take a break, and I keep asking questions. But I can, uh, okay, we're, we're stopping. We're stopping. We have to take a break. Already this break is going to push us into some weird hours. So let's take a 10-minute break. We'll start again at 8.20. I'm stopping the recording. Hopefully you guys understood that last part.